So the American Revolution wasn't a revolution, wasn't a conflict about anarchism. Uh, the, you know, neither side was pro-anarchist. But the issue of anarchism keeps coming up or uh, being raised or bubbling to the surface in a lot of the debates over the American Revolution. One famous example is uh, in Parliament, Burke gives the speech where he says, uh, in, his, in his famous conciliation, speech on conciliation with the colonies, Burke says, you know, you know, you know we're, lately during the revolution, you know, obviously the English government isn't working in the colonies anymore and the, the new colonial governments don't really have their act together yet. So really for the last year or so, the colonies have been in a, in a state of anarchy. And yet, apart from fighting us, it's all been relatively peaceful and, and orderly. And therefore, we should try and make peace with the colonies as quickly as possible before they come to realize that they don't need government at all. <laughs> now, given that it's Burke, I'm not sure how much of that was serious, how much of that was tongue-in-cheek, probably some of each, uh, just as I think sort of his earlier youthful, his own youthful defense of anarchism, I think was partly serious and partly tongue-in-cheek, and I have a, a footnote where I tell you what to read on that issue. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about Burke, I'm going to talk about these two debates uh, that happened during the American Revolution. Uh, one in 1774 uh, between Samuel Seabury, who was uh, an Episcopal minister in the colonies, a, uh, a loyalist defender of the British crown, uh, and a teenage Alexander Hamilton uh, on the other side defending the American Revolution. And the other debate is going to be two years later in 1776. On the other side of the Atlantic, we have a um, a uh, debate between uh, Richard Price, who was a, uh, um, a dissenting clergyman and a, a radical uh, philosopher defending the American Revolution. This is the famous Richard Price, whose later defense of the French Revolution prompted Burke to write his attack on the French Revolution and his attack on Price, which in turn encouraged people like Thomas Paine and Mary Wollstonecraft and so forth to attack Burke and so created uh, much for the... Um, uh, for the printers. Uh, and on the other side of that debate is John Lind, who was a follower of Bentham, who was critical, uh, like Bentham, critical of natural rights, uh, and also critical of the American Revolution, although not all utilitarian critics of natural rights were critical of the American Revolution, but he was. Okay, so starting off with Hamilton and Seabury. Now, you might initially think that in a debate between Samuel Seabury and Alexander Hamilton, there's not going to be much for a libertarian to like. On the one side, we've got Alexander Hamilton, who tends to be Libertarian's least favorite founding father. On the other hand, we've got um, Samuel Seabury, an opponent of the American Revolution, which is, you know, the one war that Libertarians like. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, all right, let's just be two bad guys fighting each other. And in certain respects, it is two bad guys fighting each other. But each of them makes a number of good Libertarian points against the other. In fact, I can argue that the, the two of them add up to you know, one complete libertarian and one complete status, if you sort of mix and match uh, <laughs> the relevant bits of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, so starting with what Seabury said in his pamphlet debate uh, with Hamilton, uh, the main concern that's driving Seabury is that the Continental Congress had uh, passed these, uh, these measures restricting trade with Britain, saying, you know, from now on, you know, shouldn't, we shouldn't be importing uh, you know, tea and stuff uh, from Britain. And uh, Seabury's worried that this is a uh, is going to be a, a restriction on free trade. And so Seabury raises what sound like, you know, at least when he has this hat on, sound like libertarian objections to what the Continental Congress is doing. So here's an excerpt. Uh, uh, here when he says, you, he's talking to... Um, uh, for those of you who have a paper, I, I'm, I'm uh, starting sort of in the, in the middle of the first long quotation on page four. Um, he's talking to his, initially he's talking to his fellow loyalists, who you is changes, you know, as we go along, but he says, will you submit to this slavish regulation? You must, our sovereign lords and masters, the high and mighty delegates and grand continental congress assembled, have ordered and directed it. They have directed the committees in their respective colonies to inspect the conduct of the inhabitants, and see whether they violate the association, whether they drink any tea or wine with their families after the 1st of March, or wear any British or Irish manufacturers, etc., etc. If they do, their names are to be published in the Gazette, that they may be publicly known and universally contemned, 
as foes to the, it should be rights of British America, not the tights of British America. Uh, but I suppose they would have been against the importation of uh, tights as well. And enemies of American liberty. And then the parties of the said association will respectively break off all dealings with him or her. In plain English, they shall be considered as outlaws, unworthy of the protection of civil society, and delivered over to the vengeance of a lawless, outrageous mob to be tarred, feathered, hanged, drawn, quartered, and burnt, O oh, rare American freedom. Now you can see there's a little bit of ambiguity here as to whether these, you know, these measures that Congress is imposing were meant to be enforceable or not. It makes it sound as though they were just trying to support a boycott, but that, uh, but the secret is saying, come on, we all know that really this is going to lead to violence against us. Will you be instrumental in bringing the most abject slavery on yourselves? Will you choose such committees? Will you submit to them? Should they be chosen by the weak, foolish, turbulent part of the country people? Do as you please, but by him that made me I will not. No, if I must be enslaved, let it be by a king at least, and not by a parcel of upstart lawless committee men. If I must be devoured, let me be devoured by the jaws of a lion and not gnawed to death by rats and vermin. How <laughs> <laughs> these guys from Good Riders? Uh, and a little later he says, you know, tell them you are Englishmen and you will maintain your rights and privileges and will eat and drink and wear whatever the public laws of your country permit. Notice that sort of the libertarian ring falters a little bit in that last part. You know, I can eat and drink and wear whatever the laws of my country permit. My country does not. <laughs> Uh, you know, without asking leave of any illegal, tyrannical Congress or committee on earth. Um, and uh, it goes on, there's more, there's more good rhetoric. You know, if you want, you can let these people in to examine your tea canisters and molasses jugs and your wives' and daughters' petticoats, bow and cringe and tremble and quake. But I repeat, by heaven I will not. No, my house is my castle, etc. Uh, before I you know, let anyone come in in my house and inspect, you know, what goods I'm using, I will, I will die rather than submit. Do as you please, but should any pragmatical committee gentleman come to my house and give himself airs, I shall show him the door. And if he does not soon take himself away, a good hickory cudgel shall teach him better manners. The first committee man that comes to rob me of my tea or my wine or molasses shall feel the weight of my arm. And should you, and this time you as Hamilton, should you be the man, however lightly you may think of it, a stroke of my cudgel would make you real, notwithstanding the thickness of your skull. <laughs> Uh, you know, so this is his main objection to the Continental Congress, is that it's, it's, uh, it's violating rights of trade, rights of trade that the colonists have as Englishmen, as, uh, you know, have under English law. Uh, so despite sort of the, you know, there's, there's sort of a natural rights flavor to this passage, but the actual laws, rights that are being appealed to are rights under English law, not, uh, not natural law. Um, now, uh, another objection that uh, Seabury raises is that the Continental Congress doesn't actually rest on consent. Now, as we'll see, Seabury is not really a big fan of government by consent. But, uh, you know, he knows that these guys he's arguing with are, and that their objection to Parliament is that the Americans don't have representation in Parliament, and therefore government of a Parliament over uh, the colonies is not by consent. Uh, and he keeps stressing, well, first of all, you know, how many people actually voted for these people in the Continental Congress? You know, a lot of us, you know, just out in the country, you suddenly hear, hey, there's some Continental Congress that's established, and, you know, there are various people who are involved in the know, and they voted for it, but most of us, you know, we just heard about these guys. Uh, not one in a hundred people voted for it. And second, and again, this is sort of a Lockean point he's making, even if they are our representatives, uh, you know, truly their power isn't absolute. Uh, you know, as we'll see, it's not clear whether you can say this in complete consistency. But surely their power isn't absolute. If it's a delegated power, well, under the, under the Lockean understanding, which Seabury is sort of adopting here, you know, was a kind of devil's advocate. Um, uh, you know, even, well, not devil's advocate exactly, but he's saying even if you grant these Lockean principles, uh, it seems as though, though we wouldn't support the Continental Congress because the Continental Congress is, is going beyond any authority we would, could have plausibly delegated to it by interfering with trade. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no. However, uh, you know, so that's all the, the libertarian side of Seabury. Um, but as we've already seen the hints, uh, ultimately he bases all the rights that, these rights that he's so concerned about, he bases on English law rather than on natural law, which means that if English law were to impose these same horrible things that he thinks would be slavery, when opposed by the Continental Congress, if the British Parliament were to impose them, it's not clear that you could have any argument against their doing so. Uh, you know, since 
you know, for his conception of liberty is the freedom to eat and drink and wear whatever the public laws of your country permit. And uh, uh, he goes on to say that the authority of Britain over the colonies is is absolute. The British colonies make a part of the British Empire as parts of the body. They must be subject to the general laws of the body. To talk of a colony independent of the mother country is no better sense than to talk of a limb independent of the body. In every government, there must be a supreme absolute authority lodged somewhere. Uh, and therefore, the you know, colonists' rights derive not from nature, but from the indulgence or grant of the parent state. Uh, you know, so that although it sounded nice when that, that line about preferring to be devoured by the jaws of the lion rather than by the rats of vermin, turns out, you know, he really thinks you shouldn't resist the lion. Uh, it's not just that it's cooler to be eaten by a lion than by rats. It's just that, you know, the lion has a right to eat you and the rats don't. That's the difference. <laughs> um, it's the English lion. You know, and merely American rats. Um, uh, then, uh, Seabury complains about Hamilton's constant use of natural rights language. And Seabury says, uh, a man in a state of nature may be considered as perfectly free from all restraints of law and government, and then the weak must submit to the strong. From such a state, I confess, I have a violent aversion. I think the form of government we lately enjoyed, a much more eligible state to live in. So he's saying, all right, you're talking about natural rights, the rights we would have in a state of nature. Well, everyone knows state of nature is a Hobbesian jungle. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, and that's what you're advocating. Um, okay, so now we get Hamilton, and again, we're going to see that you know there's a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of libertarian content in what Hamilton's saying. Although you know, in some ways, this is how liber Hamilton it is most libertarian. But you will, I think, see seeds of trouble to come in some of the things Hamilton says. But uh, you know, initially. You know, Hamilton reacts to Seabury's attack on natural rights the way libertarians always react to that sort of thing. He gets snarky and offers his opponent a reading list. So there's this line from Hamilton. Uh, you know, Through ignorance of natural rights in this enlightened age cannot be admitted as a sufficient excuse for you, yet it ought in some measure to extenuate your guilt. If you will follow my advice, there still may be hopes of your reformation. Apply yourself without delay to the study of the law of nature. I would recommend your perusal Grotius, Pufendorf, Locke, Montesquieu, and Berlamachi. I might mention other excellent writers on the subject, but if you attend diligently to these, you will not require any others. Uh, and then he goes on to give a fairly standard uh, Lockean criticism. He says, first of all, you, know, you say that in a state of nature there are no restraints of law and government. Wrong, unless you're an atheist like Hobbes. And Hamilton assumes Hobbes is an atheist. Unless you're an atheist like Hobbes, you must think that there's always the law of God. As revealed through the law of nature, we can infer God's intentions from the way that he's made us. And uh, so, of course, there are moral restrictions on what we can do to each other even uh, in a state of nature. And since you keep swearing by him who made you, you, you know, you must not really be an atheist, so you ought to buy this. Um, and uh, you know, it has this famous line, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. Uh, and then he goes on to say in a state of nature, no man had any moral power to deprive another of his life, limbs, property, or liberty, nor the least authority to command or exact obedience from him. So no one had the right to impose any orders on anyone else in a state of nature. But we decide to get together and form a government. Government has to rest on consent. The only distinction between freedom and slavery says Hamilton, is this. Under freedom, a man is governed by the laws to which he has given his consent, either in person or by his representative. Under slavery, he is governed by the will of another. So that's the difference. And because Americans don't have the right of representation in, in Parliament, uh, we are not free. Uh, we are slaves. Now, of course, you know, any libertarian is going to ask, well, you know, does merely having representation in Parliament, you know, what exactly does being governed by your consent mean? Does it mean by the individual's consent? Or does it mean some kind of collective consent or majoritarian consent? Uh, if the majority consents to something and I'm in the minority, does that really count as consent? What are we talking about here? Uh, Locke had attempted to address this problem, at least on a standard reading of Locke. Locke attempts to address this by saying you need unanimous consent to establish civil society, once you establish it, then within civil society, majority consent is, is good enough for the rest of it. So you, sort of, you, you join a society and enjoying it, you agree to be bound by majority rule and other stuff, 
but the initial consent has to be unanimous. But Hamilton doesn't say anything uh, like that, so you can uh, wonder about that. Um, uh, anyway, even if we grant that that being represented in the Continental Congress makes that a legitimate authority over you, you know, of course, there's a further question of, you know, are people really legitimately represented in the Congress? Hamilton pretty much ignores Seabury's worry that you know, most people never had a chance to vote for that Congress. What about Seabury's other objection, which is this Congress is imposing stuff that goes beyond any power we would or should have delegated uh, by interfering with free trade? Here, Hamilton you know, begins to sound a bit more like the Hamilton we all know and love, uh, with a characteristically sweeping interpretation of what the government's authority is. He says, when the political salvation of any community is depending, it is incumbent upon those who are set up as its guardians to embrace such measures as justice, vigor, and a probability of success to recommend them. Recommend them. Uh, you know, so in other words, you know, we're, you know, we've got this problem of dealing with Britain. The best solution we've come up with is not to trade with them, and so therefore you know, we have the right to... Uh, require that. Um, and he goes on to argue that you have not, in civil society, you have not just a duty to refrain from injuring your neighbor, but actually a duty to, uh, to assist uh, you know, the larger society. In a civil society, it's the duty of each particular branch to promote not only the good of the whole community, but the good of every other particular branch. If one part endeavors to violate the rights of another, the rest ought to assist in preventing the injury. Where they do not but remain neutral, they are deficient in their duty and may be regarded in some measure as accomplices. So in other words, if you go on trading with Britain, when Britain is imposing this nasty stuff on us, if you go on trading with Britain, you're an accomplice to what Britain's doing, and so that's why we have the right to uh, shut you down. So we have threatened with absolute slavery from Britain. It has been proved that resistance by means of remonstrance and petition would not be efficacious. Restriction on our trade is the only peaceable method in our power to avoid the impending mischief. It follows, therefore, that such a restriction is necessary. Uh, now, again, you might wonder how you can really justify this on, uh, on natural rights grounds. Uh, can you really justify you know, not only you know, agreement to sort of submit your contracts to disputes and so forth, but actually you, know, a, you have a, an enforceable duty to come to the assistance of society. Uh, there's also you know, something a bit imperious about the tone with which Hamilton criticizes Seabury's criticism of the Congress. Uh, he begins uh, one of his pamphlets by saying, it was hardly to be expected that any man could be so presumptuous as openly to controvert the equity, wisdom, and authority of the measures adopted by the Congress. An assembly truly respectable in every account, whether we consider the characters of the men who composed it, the number and dignity of their constituents, or the important ends for which they are appointed. Uh, and so, you know, how dare you criticize? Thanks. And um, you know, to which Seabury says, fairly enough, hey, you know, I thought we were Englishmen, I thought we had the right to express our opinions about the government. So, you know, Hamilton raises, you know, you know good objections to the rule of, the, of uh, Britain over America. Seabury raises some good, look, good objections to the rule of Continental Congress over America, put them together, and it seems as though you know, neither government had any legitimate authority. Okay, in, um, in the Price-Lynn debate, uh, Price uh, starts off by distinguishing a whole bunch of different kinds of liberty. Uh, you know, there's liber religious liberty and moral liberty and so forth in terms of what it's liberty to. Uh, and then argues that liberty means being free from, from uh, arbitrary constraint by other people. But in, in Price, we find the systematic ambiguity as to whether it's individual or collective. You know, as you'd be, um, he says he talks about the majority and says that you're free so long as the majority of people are not subject to some external will. On the other hand, he says things like, every man is his own legislator, which makes it sound as though some kind of individual consent is needed. Um, you know, so Price is, you know, it seems like he's generally a, a libertarian-minded guy, but uh, you know, he's, there are ambiguities here which Lind quickly uh, exploits. And uh, uh, you know, Lind says, look, we shouldn't define liberty by what it's a liberty to. We should define it by sort of what kind of constraint it's, it's free from. So are you free from physical coercion? Are you free from some other kind of threat and so forth? And he talks about it in those terms. And all that seems fine. But then Lynn says, well, complete freedom is impossible because 
it would mean my freedom, you know, then my, I would have the freedom to, you know, to enslave you. Um, now, in a way, that doesn't seem like a fair criticism of Price, because Price says the only restrictions on freedom he allows are restrictions that come from other people's freedom. So, uh, it doesn't seem like he's got that problem. But, then, uh, Linda raises what seems like, uh, a better objection, which is, he says, look, either, um, uh, you know, suppose you, you know, either consent has to be unanimous, or else it can just be the majority. And if it's just the majority, then what happens to the minority? Uh, seems as though by your definition they're not free. And then if it has to be unanimous, then either you get sort of a deadlock, where um, you know, no one can do anything without anyone else's consent, or else people are free to go their own way, and if people are free to go their own way, that's anarchy. Uh, it's inconsistent with any government, whatever, and you're not an anarchist, Price, so you know, what's the deal? Um, and he also says, look, the very notion of government implies some kind of asymmetry in rights between those who govern and those who are governed. Uh, and therefore, you know, this, this notion of equal liberty that you would defend is inconsistent with any kind of government at all. And again, so that would be you know, crazy anarchy. Uh, so, uh, even though uh, Price's principles are generally more libertarian than Lind's, Lind does point to what seems like a plausible uh, identification of an inconsistency in Price. Now, uh, it's not clear that Price can really defend, on the one hand, these principles, and on the other hand, you know, having a, a monopoly state as opposed to anarchy. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, although you know, these people were not anarchists uh, on either side, I think that it's no coincidence that right after the American Revolution, you suddenly find you know, more and more anarchist theorists suddenly popping up, where there hadn't been that many before, suddenly you get, uh, you know, you get one anarchist and another showing up, and I think it's because a lot of these debates help sort of bring the issue to the surface by suggesting, you know, if we really adopt, if we take seriously these liberal Republican principles that people are going for, it seems as though you take them to the logical extreme, it seems to question the legitimacy of the state as such. Okay. Thank you.